Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'd love to hear where you're all from. Uh, Rebecca's in Michigan and I'm in London. And uh, yeah, we have 30 minutes to talk about young adult fiction, something that's close to uh, our hearts. Um, and later on, there'll be a chance for Q&A. Um, so yeah, so the, the topic of today's session, I'm gonna introduce Rebecca in a second. The topic of today's conversation is five traits of successful young adult novels from the past decade. Um, and, but before we get into that, we actually really wanna frame that discussion. Um, we wanna talk a little bit about the history of young adult, because it's sort of debatable. Uh, people have different opinions on what constitutes YA. Uh, and we're also gonna have, just quickly dip into what agents and editors are looking for and some recent trends. But before that, um, Rebecca, I'd love you to introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm a colleague of, of Parles. And the reason why we're talking about this today is because the two of us met at a story grid training in Nashville and just found a mutual love of YA and formed a study group. So for the past three, four months or so, we've been looking at in depth what YA books are doing, how they're different than their adult counterparts. Um, just a couple of caveats for this talk today. We know we don't have all the answers. This is an ongoing study. It's inevitable that we're going to miss out on some books that you love, uh, but feel free to comment if you have any questions that are unanswered, if you have any books that you'd like us to study. We would love to kind of get in touch after this talk to be able to further this discussion and, and keep looking at the things that um, are really relevant to today's audience. Great. So we're going to kick start with the history of young adult. Um, and really this, I say, the, the category of young adult, because young adult is really, um, you know, a, it's a, it's a, it, it hasn't always existed as it does right now. And it's been evolving over the past few decades. And to talk about this, um, I want to ask Rebecca a question about what you read, Rebecca, when you were a teenager, because there's a decade yeah. between us. And actually, just and for those yeah. of you out there, if you would put in the comment some of the books that you're reading as teenagers, did read as teenagers, or if you are a teenager, what you're reading now, we'd love to know. Yeah, so Parl said there's about a decade between us when we were teenagers. I was 14 in 2005 or so, I think. <laughs> um, and that's exactly when Twilight came out. So I actually witnessed the shift from the books for teens being in the children's section to their own section of the bookstore. I was reading, you know, Sarah Dessen, Scott Westerfeld, um, but those originally were in that middle grade section or what's classified today as the middle grade section. How was that different for you, Parl? So when I was a teenager, I was reading Judy Bloom, which was considered really controversial. That's probably how I first learned about sex, I think, was uh, someone whispered to me in the corridor that I should go check out a Judy Bloom book. Um, and, and Sweet Valley High was, was really uh, popular amongst my friends. And what's interesting is from what you were reading uh, 10 years ago to what I was reading earlier, um, and what's doing well today. So we've got Fault in Our Stars, The Hate You Give, uh, Six of Crows, uh, Simon versus the Homo sapiens agenda, everything, everything. Um, what you can see here and what I'm trying to bring out is that the experience of YA we have really depends on the decade you're a teenager. It changes, it evolves, and as we'll go on to discuss, it is evolving now. Yeah, and so what I think is important to remember when we talk about YA is that it was a marketing decision and that it is a category. So when the publishers realized that they could market to teens and that eventually, which we're going to talk about, adults would read those books too, it exploded in popularity and getting its own section in the bookstore. I think what's really interesting about YA is that it shifts as the culture does. So if you think about The Hate You Give, if 10 years ago they tried to publish it, they probably wouldn't have been able to, not because the content isn't good, but because of the evolving cultural perspectives and mindsets that are happening as we evolve as a, as a culture. So I think that's really important to remember that YA is always changing um, and, and your tastes should, you know, if you're going to write YA, you should be, you should look at what's out today. Yeah, exactly. And so the takeaway from this little section is that exactly what Rebecca said, YA is an evolving I say beast. Uh, so make sure you read lots of current examples. You know, a lot of people quote Hunger Games. So expiring writers uh, will, will quote, will talk about how they want to be like Hunger Games. And that's great. But remember that Hunger Games is over a decade old. And although there is a prequel, which Rebecca was telling me about coming um, in 2020, um, you know, there are some really amazing 
current YA books. So I say current, even in the last five years, you know, Children of Blood and Bone, Six of Crows, um, John Green. I mean, these, you know, Ember and Ashes, there's some fantastic material out there. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the amazing books that we've been reading and why we think um, they've been successful. Um, and one other point that we will definitely discuss is, you know, where YA starts and, and when does that turn into new adult or adult literature? Because that's something that we sometimes see um, writers getting a bit confused by. Yeah, so Parl, um, that brings us to this discussion of like what agents and editors are looking for. Are there any recent trends that you have found people are asking you specifically about? Um, so, so, so first of all, I am now a freelance editor, and that's a point of distinction you want. You might want to know when you're trying to hire an editor for these sort of things. Um, I, I definitely am on top of the trends, and I have friends in the industry, but an, an editor in a publishing house, I think this is important, and, and agents definitely are a lot more on top of the trends because they see the manuscripts actually coming through, which is, and they are advanced. So a freelance editor, you aren't, unless you gossip to some degree, you aren't seeing all the more recent manuscripts coming through. Um, and the reason we included this in this section was because it's a question that we get asked a lot. And I run something called the London Writers Salon in uh, in London. Uh, and we had um, this incredible uh, commissioning editor from Penguin, Carmen, come in. And uh, we asked her this question about trends. Um, and there's a reason we asked about it, because actually, to some degree, I think you should, it's good to know about trends, but to some degree, I'm actually saying, take it with a pinch of salt. Um, because if you write according to trends, you'll be chasing your tails. Think about it like this. Commissioning editors are possibly actually scheduling for 2021 right now. They may be scheduling for late 2020, but they book their schedule way in advance. So sometimes it's really hard to be able to predict what, you know, by the time you read the book and you think it's popular, that may have, that type of book may already have filled its quota, so to speak. Many editors have already got that type of book. Um, the other point is that editors and agents all have different tastes. So again, when we had this sound, asked this wonderful commissioning editor about what she was looking for um, from from Penguin UK, um, and she was saying that you know she was looking for own voice projects, female leads, and I know that there's an agent that we've brought into the salon, and she was saying slightly different things. She was saying actually. I'm sick of female leads. I'm looking for male leads. So really at the heart of what editors and agents are looking for, maybe this sounds cliche, but I really think it's true. It's it's good stories. And there is a point that in a way you need to focus on the story itself, focus on your story, and then you can try and find the right agent uh, for you. And then inevitably yeah, after that, the right editor for you. Um, you know, writing about what you're, genuinely passionate about is is a really good indicator of where to go the really big caveat there is that you have to read widely i mean i'm sure there are writers there who just you know have have a great imagination and just happen to capture or break into a new market but generally speaking if you don't read much ya it's a good idea to start because it just gives you an indication of what the different voices are and also what you like and don't like and how you might do it better <laughs> Yeah, at this point, obviously, write the story that speaks to you. But then there are a number of things that her and I have looked at, um, the things that you can do for your story so that it speaks to the intended audience. Parl, what are those traits um, that successful YA books have in common? Okay, so successful traits, five traits of successful YA novels. Um, I apologize if the title is a little bit clickbaity. Uh, but, it, you know, we do we do want to pinpoint five traits. And uh, the word successful is obviously relatively arbitrary, um, but I guess when we looked at it, we we're looking at books that had stood the test of time that people tended to br you know, bring up as a book they'd read and actually where they've had some um, success in transitioning into film or, or, or a TV series that often indicates that it has a broader audience. So the sorts of books, just so you know, that we've been looking at so far um, are books like The Hate You Give, um, Simon versus Duff, uh, Harry Potter, False in Our Stars, Six of Crows, Everything, Everything, um, To All the Boys I've Loved Before, The Kissing Booth, 13 Reasons Why, Louise Renison, Twilight, Divergent, Children of Blood and Bone. Uh, there'll be notes, by the way, available after this, so you don't have to take notes. And if you think we've missed anything out here of like successful books, please uh, write it in the comments, because we'd love to know. And um, 
if you want us to include this in our study, would be both Rebecca and I will be happy to chat to you guys afterwards. Um, so trait number one, trait number one of a successful YA novel is that it should have a strong, clear value shift. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> Rebecca? Yeah, so at its most basic, a value shift has to do with a character changes with how a character changes on a scale that we relate to as humans. So we're talking something from a change of life to death, justice to injustice, or in the realm of love, which is what Parle and I have been focusing on at first, your character starts off maybe ignorant of someone and by the end they fall in love. And Pride and Prejudice is the most well-known example of this, but you can also consider Lara Jean and Peter Kavinsky into All the Boys I've Loved Before, where Lara Jean had a crush on him in the past, but her feelings have all but fizzled out by the start of this story. Now, during the course of the story, they decide to fake a romance together, but they end up catching real feelings, which we know because um, in the end, Peter goes out of his way to like go get her yogurt and just he wants her to come to the ski party and she does the thing that she fears most, which is gets in the car and drives um, to prove to him to tell him how she feels or in Love, Simon, the movie version when Simon's waiting in the Ferris wheel for Blue to show up and he risks being ridiculed by all of his classmates mates just to find love. So in both of these cases, obviously the characters' lives are very different from when they start out. They start off either ignorant or or they aren't in love and by the end they, they find some version of love. Obviously then the problem comes in when authors believe they've made a clear value shift, but it doesn't come across to the reader. So Parl, how can we as writers make sure we've written a shift or change that is easily understood? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and it's actually, I, I find that this is a common um, issue that crops up with particularly debut novelists, but I, actually I've, I think I've seen this also in uh, with established published writers as well uh, now and then. Because you think that you've made, you, you think, oh look, because I've definitely, I've challenged this character really hard. Have you? Have you? How do you know? Well, one way that might help you is to think about I mean, my showdown, that really memorable event. So both Rebecca and I um, sort of, we, we believe in the story grid template, which is just an editorial method, method and they call it the core event. Um, and you'll recognize the core event. It's, you know, so, so in an action story, so when I say action, I mean where there's life and death, so like Harry Potter, um, Hunger Games, that's life and death. Um, the core event is a hero at the mercy of the villain. Um, think about those stories. What what are those showdowns there? So, um, in the Hunger Games, uh, Hero at the Mercy of the Villain. Well, if you've seen um, th that scene where Katniss and Peter are on that rock, and they now are faced with this awful choice: wh which one of us dies? Because President Snow wants to kill one of us, um, and it's against. Yeah, they have in a way they're they're very much at the mercy of President Snow, and how they solve it is another matter. Um, fault in our stars. So in a love story, the, the showdown, the, the sort of big event that we, we tend to think about is um, the proof of love, that scene where we see just how much one character really selflessly gave to the other character. So in the Fault in Our Stars, um, we see that after Gus has died, we realize that actually he had been working to try and get, um, I've forgotten the name of the author, Peter Van, Peter somebody Van, the name. Uh, there's an author that Hazel really wants to get um, hold of because she wants to know the ending of the story. And this author was rude to Hazel. So Gus, even after his, even, you know, as he was dying, he was pushing to get Hazel the thing that she really wanted. Um, what about the hate you give? So what, what sort of story is that? The hate you give, um, at the core of it, there are lots of storylines here, but the core of it is that I think a society story. It's about rebellion. It's a girl standing up, with this, you know, internal journey going on as well. But the core event is when the grand jury decides not to indict 115 and there are riots and there's that really amazing scene where Star um, is in the midst of that crowd and she wants to stand up but does she? So that's the showdown. She stands up in the car and she gives her voice. So I would like you as a writer, if, if this is something you're struggling with, I would want, uh, my question to you is think of a book that you really admire. Think of that showdown. How does your showdown compare to theirs? And that's a really good in. And in the show notes, we'll include um, a link to a really good article on how to how to think of core events for your story. Okay, so yeah, I think that that's it for trait number one.
If, are there any questions yeah. about that? Is there anything not clear? Just, you know, please message us. So then um, trait number two, these books are written from the perspective of teens, which sounds obvious because, um, you know, they're young adult books for young adults. But the idea is that they've captured the essence of being a teenager. So if you break that down, we're talking about a few fundamental concepts. Number one, the age of the character. Number two, that it's age appropriate content. And number three, that it's relatable co conflict. Yeah, there's a lot. So there's so much to unpack in this. And this is probably actually one of the toughest ones to really get into. We won't be able to tackle it fully, but we'll definitely um, touch upon all these topics. And like I said, we are open to questions and even discussions after this webinar. So um, so when I had this uh, wonderful commissioning editor come to the Writer's Salon last week, um, she talked about how the Penguin team know that 50% of their readers are adults. And I find that writers often are trying to write for adults as well. Okay, so let's look at what this means. Like, how old should your character be? Point number one is that characters are normally a few years older than the intended audience. So if you're aiming this at a 13 year old, your character might be 15 or 14. Um, and if actually we, we had a little scan of all the books that we're looking at and we looked at their ages. So Katniss uh, Everdeen in Hunger Games is she goes between 16 to 18. Uh, Simon in uh, Love, Simon, or Simon versus the Homo Sapiens, uh, book or film, um, is 17. Harry Potter, 11 to 17. Star Carter in The Hate You Give uh, is 16. Uh, Kaz in The Six of Crows is 17. Bella Swan in Twilight is 17. Um, City of Bones, Clary, is 15. Um, Catherine Danziger in uh, Forever by Judy Bloom. What a wonderful book. Uh, she's 17. And in The Miseducation of Cameron Post, Cameron Post is 12. The characters are young. Now, recently I had uh, a writer, uh, aspiring writer who wants to write YA, and she said that her characters were adults. So there you see, it's like a very obvious, that's a really obvious one. Like your characters should be children. And they, but in terms of ages, you know, it gets that aspiring fact. Your character, a few years old intended audience. Um, the second thing is, um, around this we talk about age appropriate content um <clears throat> in these really successful novels you'll see that the children are front and center of the book again a really obvious thing to say but i see this so often that i wanted to bring it up you know think of the role of adults in the hate you give in twilight in harry potter in 13 reasons why in the kissing booth they're there the adults are there and they play a supporting role but in the end it's the children that drive the story. They should have a sense of independence. Um, Rebecca, do you want to talk a little bit about um, age appropriate content and yeah. this trickier yeah. concept of relatable conflict? What does that even mean? Right. So I think both of those tie really closely to the age of the character in that it's what the character's experiencing has to do with the life of a teenager. The age appropriate content doesn't mean you can't have, you know, death, the, the things that we experience in life, but it's that the characters who are relating to those things are dealing with them in a way that teenagers do or that teenagers who are reading the stories can understand. When you're talking about Harry Potter, for example, there's a lot of death in that, but it's the way Harry deals with it and how the adults are helping him deal with that in the process. And then the relatable conflict. So are your teens dealing with things that teens deal with in in um, The Fault in Our Stars? That That's more adult content, but the way that Hazel deals with it is like a teenager. So it's, it's letting your audience relate to those characters on the page. Um, Simon versus a lot of that story is him finding out who he is as a person and, and being able to accept that. And that's something that teenagers can really relate to. Which I think I think dives us right into um, trait number three, Parl. Did you wanna, did you wanna point? Trait, trait number three. three. Uh, and I apologize guys, if I'm sometimes not on the frame, we have a, f this is a new piece of technology and uh, it's not, it hasn't always been clear which camera I'm looking at because there are multiple cameras pointing at me. Uh, so apologies for that. Thank you for staying with us. Um, please do interact and please leave comments. We really, you know, genuinely Rebecca and I really want to like answer your questions and help you consider uh, writing YA and, and writing it really, really well. So- Hi, uh, Parol, can you hear I'm me really right fast. now? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Uh, sorry, I just want to uh, uh, cut in here just for a second. Uh, just to let you know, there's a lot of great questions and comments coming through. Uh, I just can't share them on screen, so we're going to save them right for the end. Uh, but we've got some people with uh, some great opinions, some of their favorite books they've been sharing. So uh, Amazing. we'll have uh, some great questions at the end. I'll, uh, I'll awesome. pop up just now. Fantastic. Thank you. OK, great. so we're going to go to trait number three. Thank you. And this relates to adult YA books and how they relate. Oh, sorry how they attract adults. And the one thing that I'm seeing that's mm -hmm. common is that these books have a YA perspective, but it's mixed with an inner journey that adults can relate to and enjoy. Now, but I'm gonna get into what that means in a second, but um, Rebecca, do you wanna talk a little bit about what the inner worldview means? Yeah, so just to jump in really quick, Parl, you might have a better opinion of this, but the best way to sell books is still through word of mouth. So when you have a book that's for teenagers, they can champion it, their parents are reading it, and that's how it spreads really far and wide, reading both, read, being read both by children and adults. Um, and the point that we're bringing this up is because the books that are successful that become movies obviously are the ones that are selling. Not that all of them have to, but that's that's why we're, we're talking about how they are relatable to the adults as well. Now, back to the, the worldview point. The worldview is at, simply, it is their inner journey. So we talked about how characters change from one point of the story from the start to the end. This is the change that they deal with in their own internal worlds. So is it a perspective change or is it a maturation plot? Um, what is that inner change that they're dealing with? Parl, can you give us some examples of this? Yeah, actually, so there's two books that I'm thinking of when I think of the inner journey that that two characters go through in separate books. And one of them I find is more relatable to, to me as an adult and that I enjoyed or that and the one that I would definitely reread. So first off, we have Hunger Games, the Hunger Games and Katniss Everdeen. Um, so externally, I mean, of course, she's facing, you know, loads of trouble that I've never faced as an adult uh, and I hope I never have to face. Um, but um, internally, what's interesting is she's actually, she starts off at a fairly sophisticated place. You know, she's, uh, takes on the position of carer and um, bread or you know, she shoots animals um, and tries to fend for her family. But but actually, and she has a very strong moral stance. We see that from the beginning because she steps in to help her younger sister. There's no way she would let her younger sister uh, be part of the Hunger Games. Um, but she she's very closed. And I feel like she has a very black and white view of the world. And by the time we shift to all that she's experienced, remember she's experienced... Um, the death of a number of people that she she loves, including Rue, that very vulnerable girl. Um, she's gone from distrusting Peter to trusting him. Um, and she's managed to keep her moral stance um, in place, despite all of the things that she's seen. There's a, there's a maturity to her by the end that we didn't quite have. It's a subtle shift, but there's definitely, um, I feel like, I would love to have that level of integrity um, if I was faced with that sort of situation. Um, there's also, I mean, as a side note, there's a whole commentary on society and the way we live our lives um, and the sort of, yeah, the increasing role of technology in being watched. There are other, other tones that make her adult, but even just if we focus on that inner worldview shift, she's somebody we can relate to as adults. I think that she, is one of those people that both children and adults can relate to. Um, the other example I had, which I, I'm less sure that it crosses over quite so well um, for both adults and, 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 and teens, is um, Duff. I, I love it. I think it's a really fun book. Um, Duff is Designated Ugly Fat Friend, um, and it's a book about a girl who um, basically has very low self-confidence, self and uh, a boy, one of the popular boys, tell, tells her that she's a designated ugly fat friend, and, and she she's sort of hiding from her own emotions she's hiding from her family troubles and by the end of it she definitely has shifted in internal value she no longer thinks of herself as ugly she no longer sees the world as black and white i think she understands and accepts the world and the truth as it is the truth being that her family is quite messed up uh, the truth is that you know she's insecure and that she wants to be loved but i'm not sure that that's as relatable and if i compare that because that's a there's a, a love story in there. If I compare that to Hazel in Fault in Our Stars, again, she's a teenager. She very much has a teenage perspective, but she's dealing with 
I mean, she's dealing with massive questions. You know, it's a book about um, a girl. You pro I'm guessing that a lot of you have seen this already. Um, you know, she's she's got cancer and she's dying. And by the end, that shift that she goes through when she accepts that, you know, yeah, I suppose she was a she was a grenade in a way, but I suppose because she has this thing where she says she doesn't want to fall in love because she's a grenade, she might hurt someone. And in the end, she realizes that actually, well, yes, she will. She's going to hurt her parents when she dies, but she accepts what Gus says, which is that you know, in life we do hurt people, but life hurts us. But we can choose who we allow to hurt us. So she has this sophisticated view by the end that, as an adult, I could still relate to, and it still made me uh, cry. It still made me. Uh, yeah maybe teary um and then finally the hate you give a star carter again is you know a she's very much a teenager you know she goes to her dad for sort of cuddles and help um but she the maturity that you know she goes from um this sort of black and white view again internal shift black and white view of what what being safe and what being um in danger is to understanding the reality of the situation that she's needed and she can accept that responsibility that the society needs her to take um so again i think that's a really good example of an a worldview shift that adults can enjoy rebecca do you have any examples or does that does that cover i think that covers a lot of, of the examples um so so i want to just add one little thing to the worldview obviously when you read a book whatever age you are you bring your own your own worldview to it right so if you have a particularly you know if you mm -hmm. happen to weep at um death or you happen to weep at um, violence or you know we'll, we'll all bring our own perspective to it but the, the books that seem to have done well have something that we can all take something from we, we can look at it from different angles katniss everdeen again uh hazel and false in our stars and, and i think star carter i think they really have that yeah, and I think that ties really nicely to trait four of these books, which is to say that they include great writing. So, Parl, you had some examples in terms of like quotable lines and things like that. Do you want to grab those real quick? I do, and you know, so it's this is this is when it gets a lot more subjective, right? Like, what is great writing? Great writing from one person to another is changeable, and one agent or editor will have an opinion. But I suppose we're trying to make the point here that. You can't, okay, yes, there are books like Fifty Shades of Grey, an adult book that did very well. And the writing, I wouldn't necessarily say it was a literary masterpiece, right? But um, <laughs> but what I did want to say is that there's some amazing young adult books out there that have done really well. And, oh my God, the lines, they're just brilliant. So like, I've got a few, I've got some of my favorite here. Uh, my thoughts are stars that I cannot fathom into constellations, which is from uh, Falls on Our Stars. Uh, uh, remember, we're madly in love, so it's all right to kiss me any time you feel like it. And that's from The Hunger Games, and that's really sarcastic. That's sort of showing the cynical aspect of their play in The Hunger Games. Um, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live, which is from Harry Potter, another Dumbledore quote. It is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are far more than our abilities. Um, and then your favorite, Rebecca, uh, is everybody, everyone is so obsessed with themselves nowadays that they have no time for me. So just because it's YA doesn't mean it's not gonna be insightful. Isn't that right? Yeah, or, or add that com comedic effect like Louise Renison does. So the thing that I wanted to say about this topic is that a lot of people like to think that they'll break in writing YA because it's easier to write. And I think the point we're trying to make is that these books they have quotable lines and intricate plots. It's not that they're easier to write, it's that the authors who write them have found the correct voice to do so, and they've gone above and beyond doing it. So you as a writer need to pay attention to what your writer's voice is speaking to, and if that audience is teenagers, because of all these other traits that you've got teen characters who are experiencing relatable conflicts, then that's exactly the space you should be writing in. So just paying attention to your voice and how that comes out on the page. I would, you know, a really good example that I found recently and is Holly I think Bourne. then Holly Bourne. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. There's so just oh, if, you, no, if go you ahead. look up, if you look up Holly Bourne and you look, you try and find like some of her uh, YA books and look at the reviews she gets. She gets people uh, and teenagers. She writes for adults as well, so she gets adults. She gets people saying, um, 
how did you get into my head? How did you know this? And I think that's a really amazing Mm -hmm. example of someone who's really understood their audience. Um, But our takeaway from this as a whole is back to that really basic point of reading widely. Like I feel that reading widely um, Mm -hmm. in young adults, but actually to be honest, adult as well is is still helpful. Um, Just reading widely helps you, can helps you become a better judge of your own work as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, cool. So now we have trait number five. Um, and this is all about um, protagonists that we can stand behind. So all the books that we have mentioned so far, these are characters that we as readers are invested in. We, You know, when Katniss is close to death or when she suffers, don't you feel it too? Um, I did, um, you know, again, Simon, going back to this core event concept, Simon in, in Love, Simon or Simon versus Homo sapiens, but he's on that Ferris wheel waiting for blue, you know, your heart's in your mouth as well. You know, we're behind them. So what's the, what's the magic to this, like to achieving this? Um, how do you, how do you get this right? Yeah. Yeah, I, personally, Parl and I have discussed this, and we think it's all about what your character wants and what they're willing to do to get it. So we can talk about what your character looks like, we can talk about how they describe themselves, but the actions that they take in order to get what they want really prove who they are. Um, McKee has this great quote, and he's you know, Robert McKee teaches screenwriting, but the point is characters are... Um, the choices they make when they're under pressure to do so. So if we all had the ability to sit on our couch all day watching TV, like, don't you think we would make that choice? But the things that we need to sacrifice, like sacrificing sitting on the TV all day because we need to make money, we have to eat, we have to um, go out and socialize, just we as humans have to do these things. Those choices that we're making and and what we risk to like to get those things that we want really show who we are as as people and we want characters to do the same things because we can empathize with them we we really relate to them making those choices and I think that's what makes for for protagonists we can stand behind. And again, this do you have any examples, me... Parl? <laughs> I know I, I used I a personal like yeah. <laughs> I do so I do have examples but I just want to say really quickly and again sometimes I feel like this is obvious there are nuances within this so a character what they want they will show us this probably in the first 25 percent like in the beginning hook of the story and then as the story progresses what they want they won't get and we will care you'll you know you as a writer will make us care about that you know Suzanne Collins definitely made us care about Katniss. She got us close to Katniss. She made us, you know, we know, for example, how important her sister was to her and how much how much she worried about her sister. We knew that it wasn't about her. It was, you know, going back to her moral position, you know, she had a strong moral position that she was to take care of her family. So when she doesn't get that, when she gets closer to death, we're way more invested in her life than in some of the other contestants. Um, Okay, so so I'll get into some, uh, sorry, the last thing I want to say is, and by the end payoff, so the last third, um, you know, this is when you probably will have the showdown and when the character will uh, almost not get what they want and then they'll get what they want and we will be cheering them behind, you know, behind them. Just like, again, going back to Hunger Games and Katniss Everdeen on that rock, we're going to be there, um, w- you know, wanting her to live. We want Simon to get blue. In fact, I'm going into examples already. So... In, 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 in Simon versus Blue, um, Simon wants two things. So, you know, he wants to find out who this uh, online character is who says that he feels the same way that he does. So um, Blue is, uh, writes a, a post. Actually, I forget. I've forgotten now. Does he write a post about being, about being gay and Simon reaches out to him? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, but actually, there's another need that goes on. And, and Simon actually just needs to accept himself. His family, you know, will turn out to be accepting, but really there's a whole struggle that's going on there for him. Can he accept himself, really? Can he truly? He doesn't want to tell his friends. It takes him ages. So what he wants and what he needs are two really important things. Um, same with uh, Duff. If I look at Duff, you know, what she wants is to um, forget the pain. Whenever she uh, has sort of strife in her life she will turn to her 
to the popular boy to have sex with him um, because she's trying to forget the difficulties in her life. But really what she needs is uh, to love herself. She needs to understand and not run away from the difficult home life that she has and her insecurities. Um, uh, Fault in our stars, huh, let's have a think. So what does she want? Um, she wants to, um, she wants to find out who the, uh, what the ending of the book is. There's a book that um, is really important to her because it, it's about a girl who's dying from cancer and, and, and Hazel really wants to know that the story ends okay for the parents. So that's what she wants to find out. Um, but actually what she needs is, is a lot more than that. She wants friendship. She needs to accept the really difficult circumstance that she's found herself in. So, so there's more than that. She, she also, you know, she wants, Again, she wants love. We know that even from the first couple of chapters, we know that oh, fundamentally she wants a kinship with, I don't know if that's the word, I feel like she wants more than that, but maybe a kinship with, with Gus, but actually what she needs again is to accept herself. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's, it. that's it for examples. Do you have any more? Um, no, I, th I mean, I think that covers it really well and it actually ties to our last point, which is a bonus point for everybody. Um, that these stories that are successful have endings that are inevitable, meaning they're going to happen and we know they're going to happen, but they're surprising. So in the case of the Hunger Games, we know Katniss is going to survive the Hunger Games. The story is from her point of view after all. But the fact that she does it by keeping her and PETA alive is the surprising part. And, and that kind of interesting twist at the end really makes us want to share the story with everybody like oh you have to read this it's so good um so that's another thing that you can do parl i i know you had a couple more examples for for this point as well yeah well so interesting so going back to the hunger games just really quickly the other twist is um yes she wins that battle but she's now created an enemy um with president mm -hmm. snow and she's starting a rebellion that's another surprising element about the yeah. about the ending um I mean, okay, let's look at Harry Potter, you know, yeah, he wins, you know, when he defeats what Voldemort, but, um, you know, he defeats, he doesn't realize that he has to be prepared to die himself. Um, and I don't think he, mm -hmm. he expected to defeat Voldemort in exactly the same way his mother um, died, you know, exactly the way the mother, his mother did for him. Um, in The Fault in Our Stars, mm -hmm. um, you know, we think Hazel's the hand grenade. We think Hazel is the one who's going to go first and she's trying to battle that, but actually it's Gus who goes rather unexpectedly. Um, and and in Simon versus, um, so the ending is that he finds Blue, great. Uh, he discovers who it is and he uh, essentially comes out to the whole school. Um, but the surprising thing about all of that is the way that the entire journey is really about himself. It's about coming to accept who he is along that journey. So I, I, this is a challenge to you guys is if, if you are thinking about writing a story, um, what, what is what's inevitable about the story that you're going to write and how could you make that surprising? OK, so that concludes our, our part. Um, Hi. If you have any further questions, we'd hey. love to hear them. Hey, guys, it's Martin here. Thank you so much for that. We've uh, had a lot of questions coming in. Uh, just saying to everyone there, now is the time to drop your questions in. Uh, for those of you on uh, YouTube, my colleague Ariel will send them to me so I can read them. Uh, but just one of them, there's been a bit of conversation on the Facebook channel, largely about the, the age of the protagonist. Um, okay. You mentioned earlier about new adult, uh, whether uh, and the distinction with that. A lot of people were throwing around, oh, what if my character is 20 or 22? Is it important to sort of fit into the YA? Does it really matter what category is, uh, Peril? I mean, so I guess it depends what route you're going down. If you're going to get a traditional publishing deal, I'm not sure that I have too many examples where the protagonists have been that old. And I suppose my challenge back to someone who's writing a book with a character who's 20 is, is this relatable? to a younger audience? If not, why isn't this adult? Could this be adult? Are you actually writing an adult book and somehow trying to force it down into YA? 
So, Paul, I just wanted to jump into, I, and I wish I had the specific example, but I saw somebody on Twitter mention that they had a protagonist in the YA space that was right around 20, or it was a college space, something like that. And again, I should have this example, but I don't, and I apologize. Um, and I think all of that speaks to the changing sort of evolving nature of YA, right? Like we want new adult to be this whole big, huge thing, but new adult just hasn't come out in the same way, hasn't been as popular. And so people have pushed the boundaries in terms of age of their characters for a YA. And I'm curious to see how that changes overall. But I don't know if there are any hard and fast rules, which is why we say read widely, um, do research on what the agents and editors are looking for, and make sure you have a reason for it, right? Like if your character is 20, is it just because you want them to be 20? Or is it because they're experiencing things 20-year-olds experience that 16-year-olds don't? So I, I yeah. think it's just a matter of being aware of kind of like what you're doing. So just in terms of, uh, you know, I've been running a few workshops with um, agents and, like I said, interview series um, with including a, a, a YA and children's editor. And I know that their response would be probably no in terms of would they accept a, a character who is that old? But they might accept that for an adult book, right? So, again, if you're going down the self-published route, you know, there is you might still find a niche audience for that. Um, but as always, the question is, what you know, what is the value shift that your character is going through? And is that relatable to a teenage audience? Um, if not, could this be adult? Um, one thing that sometimes has come up uh, with writers who've asked me this before is that they feel, and this may not be the case, I apologize if it's not, but um, they feel as though their writing isn't sophisticated enough for adults and therefore they've classed it as YA. And I, I dispute that because I don't know that that is the case. I think that you can write light uh, commercial fiction for adults um, with a 19 year old character. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, how old is, how old is, um, are the characters in one day when they start? Aren't they 18 or 19? I think they're graduating. Yeah. So they'd probably be about, they're graduating, 20. they're graduating from Scotland. So they're 22. Okay. So a little, little bit older. Right. Okay. Yeah. But they, I mean, they're still relatively young. They're not, you know, they're not 25 or 26. They're still in that. They have that adolescent. There's this scene where they, when they first meet and they hook up. I mean, that's very, uh, you know, it reminds me of like college university days. Uh, of just you know going into someone's room, I feel like so. I'm, I'm well, probably talking to you. Okay, this, this is a perfect segue into the next question. Uh, Isabel Ginsburg okay. asks, uh, in terms of age-appropriate content, what motivates the choice in many romance relationships in YA in general? I often don't enjoy them because I find them unhealthy. Someone interesting, uh, someone interesting from the perspective of an adult, but unhealthy for teens. For example, Edward breaking and entering into Bella's room in Twilight. Um, I'll sort of truncate the rest, but I suppose it's the idea of like You're, being yeah. too saucy. No, is that sorry? Is that, is that I feel like that's actually that's veering into slight obsessions. The way that it breaks to uh, Bella's room and, and sits there and stares at her definitely is a bit creepy. Let's let's be honest. Um, but what's the motive? It was a question. What's the motivation? Uh, in romance. Oh, well, I guess um, I guess it's the idea that, uh, well, she actually is on the same line as you. Uh, her former pupils would say it's so romantic that Edward did this, uh, but uh, and they would not see the toxicity there. Uh, so I guess it's the idea of like what, you know, as adults is something they find inappropriate, but if a teen audience enjoys it, then I guess what's the line there? I think that Twilight feels like to me a bit of a so this obsessive nature that they have yeah I, so I, I totally get that and i've you know i i remember going around a lot of schools um when i was when i, I did a bit of publicity in, in, in the publishing industry as well and i remember librarians would often object to some of the things that were coming out so adults can definitely have an opinion on that uh, of course if something sells then that says something about the appeal it has but actually just to step away from twilight for a second and, and just look at the sort of motivation uh for teenagers in books when it comes to romance uh, the word that comes to mind is exploration it's all about exploring and understanding so while i totally agree that staring at someone is really creepy um there is something really i i can see it from a if, if i as a younger when i was maybe younger i would have thought that that you would you wouldn't have seen the the, the toxicity of that you'd have thought that was really sweet that someone adored you um it's that innocence of feeling that someone cares for you that much that they would actually go to that length. So, but exploration tends to be the motivation. So you look at Duff, um, um, what other stories have um, romance in them? 
um, to all the boys I've loved before. There's a lot of first love. Yeah. I have these emotions. What do I do with them? How do I deal with them? Um, the kissing booth is the same. I have these emotions. How do I deal with them? Rebecca, do you want to jump in on? Um, yeah, no, I, th I think that that's exactly the case. I think that's what we've found a lot because we started with looking at love stories and it's the first time it's the, I don't know what I'm doing, but not the comfortable. I just yelled at you because your socks were on the floor for the 50th time because we've been together for years and years. So the line I think does get a little blurry, like with twilight and my opinion, and this is not based off of fact or science is that twilight came out and gained so much popularity before the fourth book was released and in anticipation for the fourth book people were very excited they wanted to read it they loved they were invested in the love story got it and a lot of people were very disillusioned once the fourth book came out and there was that level of sex in the story um, and I think it really worked only because it was so popular before and people had to figure out how the series ended I mean, Again, in the beginning, not based on, yeah. on fact, but. I mean, and go, going back to, you know, to, you know, the whole idea of um, Fifty Shades, it was based on Twilight, right? It was fan fiction for Twilight. So there's something in the formula about being chased. I mean, Fifty Shades is also very, very unhealthy, obviously, in many ways, but, uh, subjectively. Um, but, you know, <laughs> uh, again, this concept of being adored and loved uh, and, mm -hmm. and nothing getting in the way of that person's love for you. If you're in a certain state of mind, um, I can imagine you think that's nice. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a, yeah. a, a very practical question here. Uh, it comes from Evelyn Katz, and I suppose it relates to, uh, I guess, authors who are a little bit distanced from the age of their characters. How do you handle technology in the story? It changes so quickly and can really date a work. Yeah, that's, true. that's a really good question. I think that, um, so obviously fantasy helps um, because you can really step away from it. Um, I think, I wonder if it's the emphasis you put on it. So I think it depends, you know, your characters can still, so actually, let me put this in context. Most young adult books, if you think about it, they are locked within a confined space. And when I say that, they're not at work, right? They're gonna be at school, they're gonna be at home, um, or they might be at some school related venue, like a sports venue. So they have a lot of opportunities to talk the old fashioned way, which is, you know, face to face. So you could potentially base a series where they actually don't have to involve their phones to a great degree. Um, or... Sorry, I'm just going to rush through a couple other questions. I'm uh, aware that we're getting close to the hour here. Um, where someone uh, it relates to one of your points from a Robin story. Uh, on YouTube asks, is the core event or showdown that you talked about always situated at the end of the story? Ha, that's a really good question. So it's near the um, end. I, I, I did feel a bit like of a it has to be it. near the end because it's like, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 no. That's the... So I agree with you. I think that 99% of the time, it's probably in the last 25% of the book. And a, and a way to check this, so what I've been doing, and you know, feel free to join me, is I'm trying to find something that disproves that. And I have yet to find something that disproves that. So if you literally just look at any film, even if you like look at all of James Bond or like any action films or any literally any sort of storytelling, look to see when that big showdown happens. So um, in, you know, Thelma and Louise is a society story. So that's gonna, when's the, when did that big rebellion happen when they actually drive off the cliff um harry potter we talked about um what else um i mean literally you could look at shrek you could look at any form of storytelling mm -hmm. and look at when that showdown the big finale when does it happen i have yet to find i mean i think an example would be something like in wild which is the memoir where where the first scene where she throws the shoe over the cliff because she's now lost one of them and the other one's pointless it really, it, it's a technique that you can use to set up what's coming to get your reader really excited about that, that core event, where the core event in the timeline happens in the end of the story, but you're reading about it first to really help you want to get there. So that might be an example. Oh, actually, I do have one potential example. Uh, it's debatable, but Harry Potter, the entire, I'm talking about the entire series, not, not the first book. Um, 
hero at the mercy of the villain, right? So this concept of, and what, what when I say mercy of the villain, what are we talking about? We're talking about life and death. Throughout the entire story, we know that Harry gets closer and uh, further away to death because Voldemort was to kill him, right? So some people might say that the final battle in the school is the core event. I'm not sure that it is because by that point, most of the Horcruxes have been destroyed. And so I think the point in which he's the most vulnerable and therefore at the mercy of the villain is when he's standing outside the forest and he puts that snitch to his mouth and he says, I'm about to die. And that's that's definitely towards the end, but it's not right at the end. Uh, okay, I've got a just a couple more questions. This one, uh, I'll start with you, Rebecca. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's the question we get asked the most about YA. POV, which is best? I think it really depends on the story and what voice as an author you pull you bring to it, right? So there are there are books that are written in first person and third person. There's past tense, there's present tense. It's about finding the mix that works for you and your voice. I personally as a writer like to play with the first chapter. Okay, I'm going to write it in first person, I'm going to write it in third person. What sounds better? What flows better? Do I want to change POV throughout the story? If I'm going to change and talk about two different characters, can I make them distinct enough on the page? So it's about figuring out what you want to do and why you want to do it and being conscious of those decisions. But there are no hard and fast rules for it. So don't think that, oh, just because so-and-so said I don't like, they don't like first person means that I can't do it. Right. And again, going back to some, like, I go back to looking at masterworks and looking at books that you really enjoy. And like, and maybe you've already done this, but like taking three or four examples and looking at their point of view and thinking, is this the sort, is this does this device work for me? Because, um, you know, obviously the, the mm -hmm. choice you make with point of view, uh, you know, is the vehicle to the exposition you'll be giving, right? In first person, we have mm -hmm. a, a bit more of a limited point of view of the world around you, but we get a lot, we get quite into the individual's head. Yeah. Okay, Definitely. I just got one more question. Uh, a lot of people have been saying thank you. Uh, Rabina says thank you very much for your time and insights. This has been very informative and helpful. Uh, Elizabeth says thank you both for a very interesting discussion. Um, uh, but I guess the last one uh, we should be asking is, I guess, another one on the practical sense, um, Pearl. Uh, what is the best way to research what young adults are interested in reading? I guess, how do you research the market if you're looking to get into YA? Uh, so, okay, how do you research uh, what young adults are reading? So there's different stages here, right? So if you want to know immediately uh, what's ranking in the, in the retail is, that's a bit easier. You just have to go to uh, you know, Amazon or Waterstones and you can look up uh, the books that have done well historically. I think there's a chart. I think you can do it by different time, length, time periods. Um, so that's, that's one way. Um, we made a point earlier about those books that have converted over and often, by the way, they convert years after the publication. So um, Duff, um, uh, Simon versus uh, Miseducation of Cameron Post, those have all converted a few years, uh, 13 Reasons Why have converted a few years after the first publication, but they can be a good indicator. The other way to, um, the other way to find out what is currently being bought to publishing weekly um, or you can go to the bookseller.com um, and that will give you an indication of what is currently being bought that's a bit of a more laborious process to go through but that could be interesting um, actually to tell you what uh, online if you if you look up the ya community the ya reading community on instagram twitter like just look up hashtag uh you know I'm writing YA or YA reader, you will see there'll be a whole bunch of people there who are recommending books that they love. Uh, Goodreads is also a fantastic place to look at um, books that are being ranked uh, highly for YA. So they'll have categories and tags in Goodreads. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, YA readership uh, online, Twitter and Goodreads, I think is a notoriously uh, spicy membership there. Um, but yeah, they're very involved and they have a lot of good opinions and a lot of opinions. Uh, but Rebecca, uh, Parol, I want to thank you both very much for joining us today. It's been really helpful. Uh, we've gone almost an hour, but there's not been a minute without something uh, fantastically insightful. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, yeah, for joining thank us. You. Uh, is there anything else you want to plug before uh, I wrap up? Um, yeah, certainly. I mean, so uh, 
number one, if you are based in London at all and you want to come to the London Writers Salon, we hold events, um, including with agents and editors. Um, if you want to uh, book a virtual coffee with me, you can go to meetparl.com and book in a coffee. I'm also available through Reedsy. If you want to have a free chat, I'm really happy to go deep into YA. Yeah, um, my website is creativitythroughconstraints.com or find me on Twitter at R.S. Monterusso, spelled how it sounds. I'd love to chat. You can have a free 30 minute consultation with me too. And let's talk about your stories. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to wrap up, but see you both. Uh, I'll chat to you uh, by email afterwards, pulling back the curtain there. Yeah. See you guys. Thank you. Yeah. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. We've gone almost an hour. I hope you've got uh, something out of this. Uh, there's a lot of interesting points. As we mentioned before, uh, we'll be doing a transcript and an edit of this later that we'll put uh, onto the Readsy blog. If you've signed up through Eventbrite, I'll be sending you an email uh, around Friday uh, with a link to all of that. Uh, thank you again. Uh, if you have any questions, just hit me up at uh, martin at readsy.com. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you uh, in a couple of weeks for the next one of our Readsy Lives. Catch you later.